Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, Top Call drummer, educator, and music entrepreneur, Tom Hurst. And now, Rich Redman. What is up, everyone? Rich Redman here. This is an exciting episode of The Rich Redman Show coming to you from Music City, USA. As always, Jim McCarthy. Rich. How are you, bud? Doing well, buddy. I know How you're you? going to remind me. What is this podcast what about? What is it about? On this podcast, Vodcast, Vodcast. We, talk a, we talk about creatives, the pursuit of music, motivation, and success. So we're talking to authors, actors, musicians, a lot of drummers. Comedians. Yeah, we got some comedians. Dusty comedians Slay. Comedians and drummers fall within that category. Usually, a lot of time, we're the same. <laughs> yeah. Our friend Dusty Slay, I got the bug, man. You know, he always say, we're having a good time. Yeah, I, I I can't stop saying it. Yeah, I just we're having a good time. It was it was a fun episode. It's totally. If, fun. if you have if you go back and listen to some of our episodes, that would be a good one to listen to. Totally. That and the Tyler Farr that was hilarious. He's a funny guy. He was a funny guy. So there's some current events happening. I gave you a drum set today. You did, and Thank it was you. and I felt good because in the spirit of giving <laughs> and the season, I was like, Jim, I have something for you. <laughs> Are you going to lord this over I me? Said, no, I just said, <laughs> walk five feet. And you're like, what? Five yeah. feet. So in my closet was this drum set that I rewrapped for you that our friend John Hull rewrapped, yes. actually. And I paid him to do it. That kid makes a lot of money off of me. <laughs> he actually makes a lot of money off of our next guest, too. <laughs> and now our next guest, I've, Jim, I've known for 25 years. Now, some people haven't even lived that long. They're no. playing the drums and... and We've known each other that amount of time, and we were working professionals at that point. Mm -hmm. And in the in the process, our hair has gone gray. But it looks good. It does. You know, he was the first <laughs> at guy. At least to, you have hair. No, he was the first guy to do it. And I said, "What are you doing, man? You're so brave." <laughs> I do you realize this is a youth oriented business. <laughs> you know, he kind of reminds me of the guy from Mad Men. I can't remember the guy's name, the actor. Roger, John Stir Fla Roger Sterling. John Flattery, yes. Flattery, Flattery. Okay, yeah. right? so the cover is blown. <laughs> Our guest is Mr. Tom Hurst. How are you, hey. buddy? How's it going, my Good brother? to see you, Good man. Good to be here, my friend. I am so excited to have you here at Crash Studio. We've actually never had each other at our, at our you know, our recent houses. Yeah. This nice. was, you know, when people walk up, you know, uh, they go, oh, nice. I got the house is that drum built, you know, the house, <laughs> oh the house gosh, that drums right. built, you know, it's crazy that you can be part of the American dream and do that thing as a creative. It's possible. Absolutely. Now, let me just brag on you all these years knowing you, you're currently, you're still playing with Tracy, right? Yep. Exactly. Tracy Lawrence. Yep. Oh my God. Um, game changer for country music. One yeah. of the icons. Absolutely. Everybody's from Georgia now. I think he was one of the original. Isn't he from Georgia? He's actually an Arkansas guy. Oh, he's, he's from former, Arkansas. Yeah, former I Arkansas. Always, I always think of him with Al Dean because Al Dean, it was such a, he was Al Dean's hero. It, that blows me away. They talked to Jason and you know, I mean, his dad about it. it put huge, him, put huge him on a pinnacle. Album. Yeah. And we've had him on the bus a couple times and just to hear all the road stories and everything because we've done a <laughs> bunch of shows together. Yeah. And you're actually on several tracks on Tracy's new record, which we'll probably spin in a bit. Yeah. But you are a, you know, when you think of drummer, you look up drummer in the dictionary, your picture's going to be there. <laughs> and and you have came to Nashville, how many years ago? Uh, started coming here with Jack and Britton and the guys in 98. Okay, we got to talk about that. Yeah, so that's uh, 22 years ago. Yep. Wow. And along the way, you've played with people like the Backstreet Boys and Gary Allen. Check this out, folks, how versatile this is. Wang Chung, Chuck Wicks, Tiffany, Joe Nichols, <laughs> Sister Hazel, Peter Noon, James Otto. I mean, and the list goes on and on. And then a commonality that we have is that we both played um, with Amy Daly. Now, Amy Daly was the one of the first people that I played with when I moved to Nashville. She was signed to Curb Records, and she's married to Jack Sizemore, who was, you were in a band called House of Dreams. Yes. And you guys had a, a, a label deal in... In uh, probably right at, around that time. That's what brought us here. In 96, 90, 97, 98. Yeah, well, I think we signed in uh, spring of 98 with them. And actually, Peter Robinson, who signed us at the time for RCA, is here in Nashville now. He's with, uh, I forget which publishing company, but he's uh, does, does done, that, done that here for years. And didn't now. you record at Sound City? Uh, yeah, Angeles. yeah, in Los Angeles. Keith Olson was our producer. You know, the, the the people in the know there used to call it sound shitty. 
<laughs> which is so funny because there's like a documentary about it and everything and like big records have been cut there like Rick Springfield records Ronnie James Dio records like my favorite Ronnie James Dio record like Last in Line and Rainbow in the Dark oh were, yeah Rainbow in the there. Darks and, and you know Rhiannon um, I mean that's where Pat Benatar did things and we were technically we were next door in Goodnight LA oh, which yeah. was Keith's place that he built when you see the you know Sound City the, the documentary yeah. that's the place he built next door so they did stuff in both but primarily we're, we're you know we're around the same age and and we both have like a uh, an, ed an educational pedigree so when, when i uh, introduce you to people it would be a, a it's i would just say he's a drummer he's an entertainer because you do so many things you have an entrepreneurial mind you teach lessons locally you teach skype lessons you do clinics you're a university instructor you tour you have educational materials that you've written. And for a while there, I was teaching um, at the University of North Alabama. And I said, I don't want to drive two hours anymore. I said, <laughs> who would want to do this? Yeah. So you're teaching the kids over there, probably making a massive difference. Have you enjoyed it? Over oh, I loved it. And I was about to say, you'd have to say so many of these things, as funny as you, you tick them off. You're doing I, everything. Well, there's num a number of them came directly through you. I mean, the reason I'm doing the university thing now from doing UNA, I'm now also teaching at Lee University. And that is directly attributable attributable to you giving me oh. that opportunity. Hey, well, thank you. Man, that's so sweet. No, uh, where's Lee University? Uh, that's down in Chattanooga, Cleveland on the east side. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. Andy Harnsbarger was nice enough to bring me on there. I was, yeah. So I'm their applied lessons instructor there. Yeah. And then, of course, I still teach your class, the Drumming in the Modern World. Yeah, we named it Drumming in the Modern the, the World. Kid, they love it too. Man. Oh, I love it. Yeah. So, so, um, it's you went to you got your your bachelor's degree at the University of Florida. Yep, ethnomusicology and undergrad with yeah. an ethnomusicology, which adds another layer of the onion. Well, you know what it was is I they quickly told me, Tom, you probably couldn't be a performance major with your keyboard skills. <laughs> so, oh, and when you say keyboard to the uh, keyboard mallet, mallet, so keyboard playing percussion. xylophone, glockenspiel, vibraphone. Yeah, let, let's say that. No, Vic Firth never had anything to worry about for me Aaron, back in the day. <laughs> You know who you know who was real always had a leg up on playing uh, orchestral percussion is the people that had a strong background in playing a lot of piano exactly. as, as children Absolutely. and I never studied piano I mean I could play hot cross buns and you know <laughs> I know my I could peg out the scales yeah. and stuff we know functional theory and Functional harmony. harmony exactly but uh but you know just being able to sight read stuff i would i would do gigs in lubbock texas when i was studying at texas tech university and we would do uh like marimba gigs at like mexican restaurants oh my god and i would like i would be like two pieces that i would play on the marimba and then i would jump back and play you know maracas and bongos right. and stuff because the girls that grew up with studying you know, piano, we oh, were yeah, just they, sight reading read everything. their brains out. Yeah. Oh, God. Well, and you know, ironically enough now, Rich, is that I enjoy reading more. That's probably my favorite thing to do is to go to my marimba in the morning with yeah. coffee and I will sight read and stuff. Do you have a marimba at the house? Uh -huh. Like yeah, Jim Riley. Yeah. You guys are overachievers and that's, oh, a, that's an investment. Jim has like three of them and yeah. I, I sub at his studio at, down yeah. at the dojo. I really enjoy getting a nice, selecting the right pair of mallets and hitting that instrument in the correct way to open up the tone. And then you could get some Bach pieces or some trumpet pieces and you can read them. And oh, absolutely. I love it when it comes together. I too, I take a lot of my songbooks, a lot of the loud jam stuff, I'll tunes that I love. I'll take something like New York minute and play, just play the basic melody, you know, just cause I, and, and also look at the harmony cause it is cool to le learn that. And so that you were in, in a session situation, always to try and pick up a new piece. And that's why I love the theme of this whole, your whole deal with creativity. I mean, to me, I think yeah. that never stops. Yeah, man. Um, well, you know, looking at that long list of people that you played with, and then you're, you're, were you originally from Florida? Yeah, I grew up in Gainesville. Okay, and then you ended up going back to get your master's. Yeah, I that, I was uh, Scott Wilson, who's a North Texas guy, right. and I, when you were there in the '90s, I think Scott had he had a, he got two masters from UNT. You know what? Oh my gosh, he's ridiculous. And Scotty's Scotty's actually the now uh, tenured at University of Florida in charge of the jazz program. He was nice enough, offered me an assistantship, and I mean it was it worked so that yeah. I could commute and fly back and forth weekly. Well, I remember Jim when when he was getting his masters, he was already a, a working professional. And I said to myself, oh my God, I'm so glad I knocked it out back to back yeah. because the mentality of like living in the real world and being a working musician, it's either two things are going to happen. You have a perspective about life and you're going to really appreciate that school experience. And maybe that's what it was for you. Uh, absolutely. You're like, these are the things maybe I'm missing 
Well, and ironically enough, like Jim, the, the cool thing with being with Tracy was that I don't know if I could have done it without Tracy, but I could do all my work on the weekends because my son, you know, I was here during the week. I, thankfully, I only had to be down about two days a week. Yeah. And ironically enough, my case study was on Rich. And oh, yeah. you remember, you were kind yeah. enough to take the time. And, and man, I mean, that was cool too, having known you all these years. I learned so much that I didn't know. And it's kind of funny because I know how many kids get excited when they see you somewhere playing. And I'm like, man, you don't even know the, that's what you see with Aldine is just this little itty bitty bitty bit. Right. You right. know, I know. So the guy, I always say, you know, what I mean, yeah. I know the guy that everybody down there was like, well, that cat plays with a one o'clock band or when I walked in and saw him crushing Steely Dan stuff. Fusion know. shops. Yeah, exactly. Said, yeah. That's what I mean. Yeah. They, you know, I'm like, Rich is just really a chameleon. Wish, <laughs> I really wish you would find a way to get all that footage from the 90s and such. I think I, I'm, I remember seeing a video of you playing somewhere like a wedding or something like that, mm -hmm. but it was like fusion mm -hmm. and it was like, oh my God. I have some VHS tapes in the closet that need <laughs> yeah. to be digitized. You totally <laughs> need to. You, you hear it <laughs> yeah. in your play. I was I was texting with you about it, and I texted Jerry Rowe the other day because he's doing something on Nix's new solo record. And both you guys, you hear there's I, yeah, everyone knows of course you're powerful and you do that, but man, you hear the subtlety and touch yeah. and the connectivity, the fluidity. Oh, similar to Greg Bissonette, you watch him in the big band days yep. when he played with the Buddy, you know, uh, Burning for Buddy and Woody uh, Herman, and yeah, yeah, the Herman band. And you watch him play. You know, you, you, everybody got introduced to Greg Bissonette on a public. Uh, basis through David Lee Roth. Right. And he was a rocker. He was a hard hitter and he had yep. the big old blonde mullet going on. Yep. <laughs> but I mean, the thing is, is that once she started diving in as a drummer myself in the late, I'd say uh, late 80s, early 90s, exactly. he started doing, he did that, that, I learned so much from his, his video. His solo records. He had two oh or three God. solo oh records that were great as well. And him doing the Beatles, how yeah. much he knows. Well, you know, and I worked with horn players at Disney when I was just a kid. They were all much older, and that's where I got Jethro, because they, they had forgotten more about music than I knew. But many of them, so not many, but several had played in the Herman Revival Bands with mm. Greg. And they all talked about what an amazing reader he was. And you were a Disney staff musician, right? Uh, yeah, I started as a student out there playing in, in high school. I just got lucky. My drum instructor was tied in, and they auditioned me. And I guess I danced around and smiled enough and yeah. you know, got in and so then, and then moved on and subbed out there. Like Beth Gottlieb helped me quite a bit. Danny's oh, wife. Beth, yeah. yeah. Beth, I knew her as Beth Raddick before she and Danny. That's were right. Yeah. I got, I got to say, say one thing about yeah. all the people you played with. Yeah. And you know, we mentioned things being in closets earlier. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a, I'm kind of a, believe it or not, a closet Backstreet Boys fan. Oh, brother. They're yeah. awesome. They're awesome. Their They're tunes really good. And my little boys figured it out now. He's like, daddy, you played drums for them. I was like, for a brief minute I was there, I was a drummer for the first two years when they weren't famous I was their original touring drummer and we, nice. and I actually played with them when they got signed to Jive but uh, I'm the I'm the one that turned down going to Europe with them because my band what it is was moving to California and I was like nah I'm gonna do my band there's so many <laughs> layers and Whoops. what it is was kind of like a Tower Power funk thing yeah we yeah. were like if you can imagine Jamiroquai Tower Power oh, but Jamiroquai. but like a heavy like our, the leader Avi plays still to this day with John Schofield he's the rhythm guitarist guy and it was really him and a guy named Jerry Kennedy with I mean, they were brilliant yeah. talents. And Jerry's in the uh, In Vogue video, Never Gonna Get It. That's him playing bass. So, ah. so, I mean, these guys, I just lucked out. I fell into that gig. And, and was that the Bay Area? Uh, yeah, we went to, that's, I moved out there with them around the time I met you. Yeah. And Because uh, I was also playing with Hazel, and that's when I got Mark involved. <laughs> and that's how I turned out. Yeah, so I went to, I didn't go to school with Mark, Mark Trojanowski, but Mark was a graduate, another graduate of the University of North Texas who went on to start um, a, a kind of like a successful um rock band in the 90s called Sister Hazel yep. and you would sub for Nick and you would play percussion yeah the, the deal was is that I grew up with the two front men of Sister Hazel That's Ken right. and Andrew and I played boys club football and then Andrew and I were roommates and they had an original drummer uh, Brant who moved on to do rock and they asked me to be in the band and I, I was like I couldn't do it at the time I was doing Backstreet and what it is but I said man I know this young guy down in Tampa and he had just graduated North Texas and it was Mark, Mark Texas. so I introduced Mark to him and I mean he just took the bull by the horns he's such a smart businessman and those guys will credit him all day to that end because wow. the, the four front guys are just the most charming charismatic dudes and and then you get Marky who is like super smart and, and driven business business savvy works he, he you know he's like rich he's, well, he, nobody's well, gonna outwork him I remember in 1997 I was playing around town with a girl named Vaughn Penn who yeah, was gonna be like name. a Cheryl Crow type thing and and uh, Strojanowski was managing her <laughs> and so like Trojanowski <laughs> would come to the sutler and stand in the back with his pen and paper and be like <laughs> Tempos are wrong, and the uh, band needs to dress differently, or whatever. You know, he was th he he was putting himself in that role. I remember already. him doing this. That's right. I, so I don't know if he stuck to that business model of trying to be a business. He actually has done some other things since, and and now he's you know they're doing a lot of things like you do. They're doing a lot of corporate tie-in work where they go in and speak, um, you know, for different um, and really on kind of similar themes on creativity in the business world that's and, great. and entrepreneurship. Mm. And that's Mark is spearheading a lot of that. Well, you have run with that, my friend, because when you keep peeling the layers 
years, you think to yourself, oh, okay, um, Tom is co-owner of Infinity Percussion, which is an indoor drum line. Yeah, 15 years now we've been going. What? That's How do you own a drum line? It's like a guy owning a sports team. <laughs> I know, I know. Like, you own humans. <laughs> it's totally, and that's the thing. I'm just a founder, which uh, my partner, John Campese, is the guy who really runs that day in, day out. But we had taught drum corps together, and I, I wanted him to have an outlet where drum corps can, if you know anything about it, it can be very political. And I just wanted him to have a place where he could really, he's an icon in Florida. And to, the drum indoor drum line thing was taking off in the early 2000s i was doing it teaching a high school and got we got started with it and i mean he's grown it to the point now where we have 150 members each year between three groups and so, you guys won 2014 w wgi world champs yeah in our open class and we've never won the world class our top group the, that's a, a bloodbath the best i think we've ever done is fifth and actually a group from here from nashville music city mystique they're really the pioneers and they're regular champions that man if you're getting in that top three it's honestly if you watch the top 10 groups i've never seen the mystique Oh yeah, they're phenomenal. Wow. Yeah. Are those a lot of the guys that come in will do, um, say like uh, one of these performers wants to have a drum line with them exactly. on the ACM Awards? Yeah, we did the one for Little Big Town that Jim yeah. and I put together and yeah. then they did another thing for them when that, because that was for day drinking right when it was premiered and then when it hit and was on number one, I think for the winter show that you guys always play in November, the CMA Award. That's or, right. Uh, they had, uh, I think the Mystique guys did it then. Dang. And the guy that founded it, uh, Don Click is a buddy of mine. I marched drum corps with him in 88. I'm going to tell you two nice things right now your shirt looks great on you oh thank you and i want to tell you that your voice sounds really right nice on the microphone oh thank it's kind you of like talking like this oh time. no it's seriously in the world i, I mean, know I, it's like, can well, you just do that as go let's go it's almost like uh, the world it's almost like the the howard stern thing where he's like <laughs> <laughs> and the girl's yeah, by the speaker oh, robin <laughs> Uh, let me let me to fly my Howie copter out to the the Hamptons, Robin. Ooh, I, Robin. I've been thinking a lot about Howard Stern lately because uh, my girlfriend of like a year and a half, Kara. Yeah. I don't know if you met Kara. No, I've met her. She's um, awesome. Thank you. She. Um, uh, is a huge Howard Stern fan. Like when I'm talking, like uh, listening to him every day for 30 years. Yeah, and he's on four hours a day, and she will find the time to listen. No, somehow between the mm -hmm. gym and the, her commute, an hour commute each day, she listens. Great. She will listen to, and she's, she's like, "This is the guy you have to aspire to because he is the greatest interviewer in the world." He is very good. At he that. really is. Yeah, he has yeah. a gen genuine interest in people, as I do, Jim. I got to tell you something. When I hang with Tom, it makes me think about music education because we story. are a product of music education. Absolutely. We are big believers in music education. We like to mentor and nurture the next generation of musicians. And you know who else loves to do that? School of Rock. Yeah. So I don't know when this is going to air, but last night I got to MC and play drums for a huge event at the Ryman for the School of Rock Rocks the Ryman. So all their student organizations from the Franklin School and the Nashville School got to play. So these are kids like between three and 18 years old. Wow. And they played everything from the offspring to Zeppelin to punk. Like they played everything. And it was, an, it was a massive event. And we raised a lot of money for uh, a, an organization called... Um, Learning Matters. So if you guys want to help with that organization, check out learningmattersinc.org. Uh, but my friends, Angie and Kelly McCrite own the School of Rock. I don't know if you've done anything for no, them. No, I never have. It'd be I'm something a big that'd fan. Be, it'd be great for you to get involved in. They've been around for about 10 years. There's 250 locations globally, mm -hmm. and they always have one of the top performing schools. So if anybody is interested in getting their kids involved with the School of Rock, they sponsor this show. We really appreciate it. Here's some email addresses. Nashville at schoolofrock.com or franklin at schoolofrock.com you're going to thank me tell them I sent you because your kids are going to learn bass they're going to learn to sing they're going to learn to play the drums they're going to learn to play the keyboards they're going to become better more well-adjusted confident humans you know um and all the information is going to be in the description uh, portion of this uh, episode, of course, as they always are in all the episodes that, that they're sponsoring. Show notes. Um, being that this is such big on, on education, I don't know if I told you, because we always talk about Spencer, my son. Yeah. You know, he's a, he was at first a drummer. He still is. Okay. But he's a very musical person, as we're finding out. We bought him a piano. He took to it like? Unbelievably. Because he brought home a... Um, uh, what's the wooden a mini xylophone mini xylophone yeah uh and you know he started learning it in school and everything in band and because it's like a piano and my brother's a piano player oh, okay so he got the the piano for christmas mm -hmm. and within i mean the first 20 minutes he was not hitting any sour notes playing stuff better than i could ever he's got a great ear 
Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Because last time I was over there, Jim was Jim and I were trying to figure out the um, John Carpenter theme in 5-4. Dato, do, dato, do, dato, 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 do, dato. And I said, Spencer, come over here and play some drums in 5-4. Just go, you know, boono, ga, boono, no, ga, do, ga, da, boono, ga, do, no, no, ga, do, ga. And he, he had no interest. He was glued to his phone. But yeah. um, now he's, he's got the uh, he's got the piano. We got, uh, yeah. I mean, it's it's one of those things we got to look into school of rock for him. So, Tom, you got the indoor percussion thing happening. Uh, dare I say this is you know, you have all these different revenue streams. They trickle in. You're never going to be without some money trickling. You know what I mean? Because you've created this. It's great advice for an entrepreneurial creative in this new world with, cause the music business is dying a slow death. Sure. It's, it's been massively impacted. Sure. And so you can't just be a session drummer. You can't just be a touring drummer. You can't just be an educator. You can, yeah. but the smart ones do it all. Diversification. Is you do key. it all. So if you have 30 days in a month, you're playing at a church, you're teaching, yeah. you're on the road, you've got the university, city gigs you're doing it all and then you do drum tracks from your house so i mean let's face it you buy you have a nice drum set you put some orlx on the walls you go into pro tools you get some mics you're set yeah you're in business absolutely you know that's a really really fun thing speaking of do you want to hear some i'd like to hear uh, have the audience hear a little bit of your playing on this new tracy lawrence record made in america and when i heard i think it's just so cool to be in the same room you know when you're doing a recording session and you hear that iconic voice in your headphones right. you're like damn well, I'm yeah. here oh I get it I mean I know for you it's not because you guys have come along so far but anytime I ever say to a friend oh my buddy Rich plays for all you know Jason Aldean they flip I mean I've got friends you know because to them you know, it's, got it's, that voice. It's, it's hard for you to see it as such I'm sure but it is he's an icon you guys have become an iconic entity with that and that's it's cool and then to be in that setting that's why the other night I was nerding out on Night Train <laughs> <laughs> were you just sitting in your place in your underwear I'm drinking a glass of red wine <laughs> what are you saying? I, don't wear don't yeah. wear underwear <laughs> <laughs> Rich does have amazing shaker technique. Shaker. He's got that easy touch. <laughs> yeah. I like it. The concentration on your face. <laughs> well, I don't know what it is because you know, just trying to lock your shaker or your tambourine or your maracas with your drum track, it's an, it's oh, an intense thing. Yeah, it's hard because man. people don't listen to music anymore; they look at waveforms. Well, you know, you and I have always we've been doing that a long time. I think I know both of us were doing the acoustic percussion type thing mm -hmm. very early on. Congas, djembes, yeah, yeah. um, uh, hand percussion, yeah. and. Uh, it was a way to be involved. I mean, otherwise you're being left out. You know, it's like, hey, I, yeah. if I can be diver diverse here, and I know I've always loved growing up, for me growing up in Florida with a lot of guys from Cuba and Puerto Rico, yeah. and for you being in Texas, I mean, yeah. man, I just have so much respect. So many of my favorite drummers are of, you know, from different, you know, like say, coming out of that totally. tradition. There's congas and black beans on every corner, man. Oh, right. It ain't you. This is uh, you on the new Tracy Lawrence record, Made in America. Fiddle. Little Joe Cavalry, that's our band leader. You hate my old truck. He's been with Tracy for like 20 years. With reality. You say you hate my dog. And I live in a fall. Well, it all seems pretty clear to me. Well, I'm out of here, but baby, it ain't you. Don't blame yourself. You know that man on guitar. I need to find someone to love me. Damn if I know who to lose. Uh, maybe it ain't you. You're getting mad when I've been gone. And sometimes you find out who your friends are. <laughs> That's a good song. <laughs> Jim, you can't shake the radio bug. <laughs> Jim worked in radio for years. That is fantastic. And it's like, you know, when you think about, um, you know, there's there's people on the coasts and people that play other kind of music and the, and and you try to use the word pocket. And you when you think about pocket, you think about pop drumming, you think about R&B, funk. R &B, funk. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. That This thing right here has a swagger, it has a feel, it has its own identity. It, there's an expectation to create, and oh, not to man. have that thing budge and make it feel good. Hit the kick drum the same every time, hit the same spot on the snare drum. The fills can't be like eye popping or catching or no, they they're need just- to support the melody. And you gotta stay out of the way. And then it all comes together like a fabric and the right hand on the acoustic guitar, you're jangling. And then the steel and the fiddle fill in around the melody. Oh, man. And so it just comes 
comes together. Well, you know, and you've done so much more session work. I mean, I've always admired the work you do, but like to sit in a room and have Brent Mason sitting, you know, seven feet away from me. I mean, I'm trying just to not be totally starstruck. And, you know, Danny Rader, acoustic guitar, oh, God. that right hand. Danny Rader is flawless on that acoustic because he did, I think Danny, you know, everybody starts off playing a little bit of drums and they go, yeah. I want to play a real instrument. <laughs> <laughs> and then they leave. Um, yeah. So that's one side of your playing personality. And then you have a, a fun group that you play around Nashville, like Douglas Corner. It's called the Power Triplets. Yeah, this is um, my buddy of another 25 years. My pretty much, you know, like you, man, my dearest brothers, Chris Nix. It's his, uh, really his brainchild. And we've been doing it together since we, we put it together down in Florida. In I did not know that 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 Chris Nixon, you go that far. Back. Oh yeah. He called me, he calls me the chamber of commerce, uh, commerce. I talked him into moving up here. I kept bugging him ah. much, much like you. I'm, I can still remember you when I was commuting all those years. Yeah. <laughs> Rich would be like, he, Jim, he'd be like, buddy, you just gotta be in town. You can't, you can't go back and forth. And I was like, well, I love- <laughs> I'm trying, man. I just, I don't know if I've got enough gigs and <laughs> we'll get to that. But, <laughs> but I, it was thanks to you that I did finally, I was literally playing out the parks one day at Disney. And I thought, man, if I'm going to be serious about Nashville, I've just got to, be there all the time. Rich is right. And that oh was, that literally, God. that literally crossed my mind on a set at animal kingdom, but not to digress. Uh, that's really, thank you for that reminder. Our I brother, guess. Yeah. yeah I, I guess. And it, everybody does an impersonation of me. And it involves <laughs> buddy. <laughs> buddy. <laughs> the rich Redmond show. We'll be right back. Learn by doing. I definitely think resonates with what we're about here at the school of rock. I'm Angie McCright, and I'm the owner of the School of Rock in Franklin in Nashville. I would say that the majority of kids that come in have either been sitting in their bedrooms watching YouTube, learning how to play, or they've taken music lessons at some point in their life. We do have a lot of beginners. It doesn't matter what level you're at. You can participate in our programs, whether you're a beginner or you're advanced. We don't teach music to put on shows. We put on shows to teach music. Connect with School of Rock today. Search School of Rock Franklin or Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. And we're back. Bills are paid. We get to keep this place. And Tom, we were talking about the other side of your personality. So we're talking, you're, you're playing like a, a down the middle country train beat. And then you have this group with, with Chris, yeah, Nix, Chris Nix, yep. and you guys go way back and it's called the power triplets and you play all over Nashville. You guys play um, the high watt, you yep. play Douglas corner and let's give a little, this is from a new record. It's called high yep, H I. Yep. You can find it on Spotify and this is called brain tickle part one. <laughs> <laughs> Six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. Oh, it's like the rolling, <laughs> the rolling counter. <laughs> Charles. Musical algebra. Damn. I'm thinking you probably could have auditioned for Dream Theater when you're holding <laughs> auditions. <laughs> oh no. I don't know. I don't think I could carry it. Not not no, in no, there no. with Mike Mangini, man. <laughs> that is awesome, man. That's the other side of your personality. 
So if we had a baked potato in Nashville, you guys would be playing there. Uh, I think we would love to. We've done Rudy's. We've played played in Rudy's, and oh, yeah. we really had to tone it down volume wise. Nashville, Nashville has a jazz club. Oh, it's an a official awesome jazz club. Place. I used to play at F Scott's all the time, yeah. but it was dinner jazz. Yeah. Um, and I don't even know if it's still there. I don't I, think so. I don't think it is. I think it's something else. Because uh, what was the guy that yeah. always did that there? He was had the house gig during. Yeah. Um, if not, if back in the day, it was like a jazz club in Nashville. And yeah. I remember moving here. I was like, what can I do that's kind of jazzy that I can you know keep these chops up and you know meet new people and i played with the tennessee jazz orchestra and the nashville jazz orchestra big bands yeah and then i would play around we just had a, a guest on joe turley have you ever played with I, ivory I, joe i know joe's name i don't know him i don't think he would know me great musician great um, musician and that's the nashville jazz workshop was that around oh, that, uh, that was coming up remember the drummer chris brown oh he's, absolutely he's yeah. around I, he was a north texas guy I played in the one o'clock haven't seen him in years wow I, that's you know. A, you know who i just saw who i think you did you know i maybe asked you about him clyde connor that was in north texas he's a one o'clock guy yeah he's down teaching at florida he and i did grad school together yeah. Br ridiculous brilliant drummer played with the navy uh, navy commodores yeah the uh or the jazz the commodores or is it the airmen of note there's yeah there's airmen of note for air force and navy's got the jazz commodores and then there's like think like the jazz ambassadors with army yeah a lot and of all those bands are they, ridiculous they, they, a lot of my friends went on to play with the airmen of note right and they and you know you get a nice salary you get a 30-day pays vacation you get dental oh, medical yeah. like you know the military is not a and they and they raised the cutoff date to 39 years old i didn't know that yeah, they raised it i think they might be hurting for musicians or and those are those are great gigs because yeah a guy named Dudley High Note great note for a, a, ba note, a bass yeah. trombone player of yeah. all people he's been I know he just I think retired from the Airmen and wow. uh, he was a guy I worked with at Disney retiring you see yourself retiring uh, no I, I definitely you know I think like you said man we, we get a lot of irons in the fire yeah. and plus I love what I do I don't feel like I've ever worked a day in my life I feel like yeah. I've you know gotten to be and again why because I'm tapping into my creativity and my you know just, just trying things that come across my brain what was a in you know uh, what was a game changing moment for you in your life? Oh, early. I, uh, Disney. There's no question being on, uh, you know, two things really, to be fair, joining the drum line at my high school, because through that I met so many people that really pushed me and I, it, they opened my mind to different I ideas. Cause you know, even going into high school, I always felt like, Oh man, how will I even graduate? You know, you always, I was probably my own worst critic and being around friends and realizing to be, be part of a little family like that. My drum instructor, a guy named Paul Rorig, and, uh, he's an interesting guy. You got to look him up. He's now a professor of economics has written all these books that are like huge in, you know, in India yeah. and everything. But at the time he was just a student at university of Florida in the drum line. And he taught us and was kind enough to encourage me to audition for Disney. And that's really where it started. I ended up out at the parks as a, in, at like 16. Wow. And I mean, man, that changed my life. Cause I started meeting people from North Texas and I'm playing with guys from university of Miami and Indiana and Berkeley. And it really hit me over the head. Like, Oh, this is the level of musicianship. But, but you, you were playing drums and getting paid at a young age. Yeah, and you yeah. really connected the dots and started working. Well, and I got lucky cause I kind of had two, I had two irons in the fire. I was also back home. Thanks to your bandmate, Jack Sizemore. I yeah. was bugging him at the store. I was like, Hey man, I play drums. You know, I like, you know, <laughs> you guys have been playing together a long oh, time. I've 30 years. Jack is literally my big brother. I mean, he, I was, was bugging him at 14 15 in the music store he worked in mm -hmm. and he would he kind of encouraged me to get into local garage bands which led me to playing in like i lucked out and started playing in like dance bands that were pretty much funk and soul so i'm doing that and working at disney in those two places yeah you know can you believe that i've been playing with jack in the same band for a decade oh i know it blows That's me away. 365 days times 10. Your band, man. You guys, I always say, I mean, that is the most impressive. I mean, y'all are a gang to begin with. Don't mess with or that. like a motorcycle That gang, outfit, yeah. man. You don't mess with all Dean's bunch. <laughs> but the sweetest bunch of guys. I mean, y'all have always, you're the same dudes. I, I don't care if y'all were playing the Enormo Dome. You're the same guys. Jay's going to run up and give me a hug. You're going to give me a hug. I'm going to see you. You know, you Tully, barefoot. Tully's like texting me, you know, every time we see y'all. Man, and I know how slammed you guys are. You yeah. know, we get it. I know. It just means a lot that guys have stayed. And that's your boss, too. I think I'll Dean, Jason's such a down to earth dude. Oh, so yeah, it's just we've talked about how lightning in a bottle it is. It's to have somebody who's got a such a memorable sonic identity mm -hmm. and somebody that is as loyal as he is and somebody that connects with people male and female fifteen to fifty five, oh, which dude. is nearly impossible. It's incredible. He's, he's a salesman. Yeah. 
and and and, and builds rapport is incredible in in such a genuine way i mean yeah. man meeting his dad though explained a lot you know we did that show with y'all in wisconsin a couple of years ago and i've been sitting up on the bus with y'all before the yeah. pre-show gym they had us up you know and i'm just laughing because it just you know it's so funny that jason's dad's just slamming on him teasing him about being such a fan of tracy yeah. and then tracy's sitting there and it's just cool man that's it's you know i worked with jay before he ever got that gig you know and that's it's just neat to see the, the sincerity that runs through that outfit yeah it is fun well i mean you and you continue to peel the layers back uh we add the fact that you started a promotion company tom hearst presents i'm trying to wow <laughs> jams and i remember seeing you you know hey you, you get the llc you come up with the name you get the llc you get a facebook page you print a banner you start shaking hands you're in business so then you started promoting shows at douglas corner i'm like i'm like look at this mf -er. he, he's taking life and just make by the balls right and then next thing i know i'm doing my drummer's weekend yeah and i'm and, and i'm announcing from the stage you know i'm then pulling up the kids from the crowd hailing from the great city of Fargo, North Dakota. And I bring a kid up and there's this crack house band and they get to play at Douglas corner in front of all these people. Yeah. And, and I would see there'd be drummers in the back of the room and they'd be looking like, what is this mother doing now? <laughs> and I'm just, we just take the cue from each other. Yeah. You know? uh, well, you, I remember not to interrupt you, but I remember you reaching out to me in about Oh five, Oh six. And you called me one day and we were talking about, you were wanting to start doing the clinics before you did crash. And yeah. I mean, of course me being me, Rich is so good about jumping right on. I'm like, yeah, I'll get right to that. I got to go substitute teach or something today. <laughs> but like we talked about doing things even together and you went and did it. Did you substitute teach when you moved to town? Yeah, yeah, quite a bit. Did I, you, I did too. You did too for like you? five years, it was 75 bucks a day. Yeah, Metro with, uh, I worked, I can't remember, not yeah. Nola, before but Noel it, Jones. It, but yeah. this was before it was online. So yeah. you would get a, a call and your landline would be, this is the Metropolitan <laughs> Government Schools. <laughs> we have a substitution request for Rich Redmond yeah, at Rich Redmond. Yeah, Pebble Hills Elementary. And then you would say, press one to accept. Yeah, and you're press like, two what to decline. Yeah. Why don't you just did say it, the name it, of the movie you'd like to see? Did it sound like, what's his name? Steve uh, Urkel? No, 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 no. The Steve. guy who was in the wheelchair, the smart guy. Oh, 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 uh, oh, gosh. Um, Universe guy. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Hawking. Stephen it really Hawking. was. Stephen Hawking. It has that voice, and it was right? like pre, it was pre-internet. It was pre-MapQuest. Oh, it'd, like, it'd be about 6 a.m. too at the latest. You'd be at 5, 45, 6 a.m. you'd get that call. Yeah. And I was I had doing my, it. I had a briefcase. <laughs> and I had my Dockers. Well, I don't know about you, but I did the same. I mean, did, it was a great way to meet all the band directors around town. If you wanted to teach and stuff, you go in and now they know you're in Metro. You've been background checked and they're like, oh, wait, you could sub for me and you can continue with my lesson plan. So you're not just going to, you know. You, you need to get actually, a TB test. Yeah. I'll Remember, just, I think I had a tuberculosis <laughs> test. I'm like, tuberculosis. And you had to do it over in East Nashville, over where I used to live, yeah. where my place in Inglewood. Yeah. You did well. You were really smart. You were ahead of the curve in East I bought, Nashville. Me, I bought my place. You know, I, I, again, right time, right place. I think my, my mom's best friend in Florida was a realtor and she, she made me sell my place in Florida in 08. She says, Thomas, now. And I was like, Carolyn, but I want, no, no, now. So, and I did, and I sold it and was kind of sitting on it. And that's when, uh, you remember Heather, my son's mom, yes. I met her and I was kind of looking for places and we found the place in East Nashville. I crashed your first date. <laughs> this is great. This, you got to tell this. Oh, so, <laughs> so your ex-wife, you were on a date with her at McCabe's pub yep. in Sylvan Park. At the time, I lived 200 feet across the street. I think you and I had been trying to figure out how to get together at some time. And I just happened to, she was going, she taught at Cockrell Elementary right over the hill from his place. I probably substitute taught at Cockrell Elementary. Um, <laughs> what you accept, press one. Yeah. <laughs> no, and, and it's funny, Heather and I are, are really good friends. We've been divorced now for four years and she's a great mom and good guy. I was talking to her actually this morning and, you know, when I had to bring some stuff for my son, but that's, we, we laugh so much. And again, I'm going to do my bad. I crashed it. My bad rich was this though. We got talking about the gray hair and she's like he's sitting there he's like you know i think after you'd already called her in a milf <laughs> that sounds like me i said good for you tom look at this milf because she already had one one kid on the and uh, oh, i probably said oh you already have a child <laughs> You're a you, said that, you said that in front of him? <laughs> oh, dude. I said it to Heather, her. <laughs> Heather loves, to this day, Heather loves Rich. She'll, I haven't seen she'll, forever. she'll ask me about you. She's like, oh, I saw Rich on TV. How's he doing? You know, and she thought he's the, the best. But we laughed about, <laughs> what was it you said with me with the gray hair? Buddy, you're so brave. I mean, man, you know, and I'm like, Rich, who am I fooling? I've been gray since like I was like 28. That's, that's, that's like Rich's nice way of saying, what are you thinking? <laughs> 
Buddy, 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 bless your heart. heart. Exactly. <laughs> buddy can mean anything. Buddy, buddy has so many different <laughs> dynamics. It really does. What was the one thing that you were looking at me one time? You, you looked at my shoes and you just kind of went, "They look comfortable." <laughs> and I'm like, dude. Oh, I've dude. got a family for crying out loud. Sizemore is like that in his own way. Sizemore can just look at you without saying anything. And he just, I, I'm like, what, man? Like, you know, he's like, again, you know, it's family. I mean, you know, I've, 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 I don't know how many times I've gotten the, the eyebrow from Jack. And I'm like, I don't know, man. I'm just trying something different. That is funny. Oh, my God. So you start promoting, you yeah. know, events around well, town. And yeah, then yeah. you also do the Nashville Drummer's Jam that has exploded now this is a, an event you do usually twice a year and you pay tribute to massive drummers so right. you've paid a tribute to phil collins stuart copeland john bonham Neil alex van Kurt, halen alex van halen and you always invite me thank you Aww. and we, we usually play on the appropriate drum set uh, if possible a replica and, and our sponsors have been great about that you know <sighs> even though it's not necessarily who that drummer plays you know over the years um david's david parks david is really parks. it's really his sh show concept. you guys are kind of yeah yeah he he got the idea from brian tishy's bonzo bash gotcha. and i was already doing loud jams for exactly the reason and you know we talked about it i remember having you out in the early days in 2011 loud, loud jams started as the loud jazz jam and the loud comes from john schofield i just love that record loud jazz. yeah loud That's jazz you know uh omar uh, king i think i think Dennis is Dennis, Dennis on this. I think it's Dennis, and I, I might like Blue Matter even better. Oh, Blue Matter is probably my favorite, and I, I just love that era. <laughs> Dude, is Blue Matter the one where So You Say is on with that crazy cowboy part, or is yep. that on? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I still to this day can't play that. But I got, I got to say about the Nashville drum, Drummers Jam, the one that I never been to one. I mm -hmm. want to go. You should. One of the ones I really wanted to go to Alex was Van the Alex Van Halen. One oh my gosh! Of the, you got the actual drum kit, man. And let's give some credit where it's That's due. I think, I think you guys probably know John Douglas or know of him. That yep. you know builds all the beautiful kits, and he was Alex's tech. That's all John. That was David Parks getting with John and the the Ludwig guys, you know, helping us out over there. But man, I can't say enough about the Van Halen brothers. I know all the stuff in the press. Yeah. Those guys have huge hearts for charity i mean i can't there's some things we agreed i'll tell you sometime they did some stuff and irving azoff as well on behalf of a local charity here uh, open table unbelievable on top of having him struck the kid in not just the drum kit it was the riser i mean alex's road cases rolled off you know we were like a bunch of little kids i know? bet so but alex I, I hear he might be a little bit of a hermit. He didn't want to come. No, no. He was great. He did a yeah. video for us and thanked That's us. Right. And it was real. And it was hilarious. I mean, he's a rock star. This is a guy. He oh. probably can't go to uh, Ralph's and buy uh, his own no, toilet paper. No. And I mean, he's out there on his his horse farm. He's got his horse and he does the why, why the long face. And I mean, he was brilliant. But <laughs> dude went, he bent over backwards. Eddie, you know, Paul Sedotti from Taylor's band. Yeah. They were, the, the Taylor guys were all playing. So Matt Billingsley, they played, I think, Panama as a trio. Yeah. And they literally had gotten in from Australia the night before. So. Amos, huge thanks to Amos and uh, Matt Billingsley and Paul Sedotti. Well, Paul's really dear friends with Eddie. And so Eddie's calling and texting with Paul during the show. How's it going? Because he sent stuff too. Nice. I mean, man, we will, awesome. we could never top. They, what they did was, and the funniest thing is, I remember I, I deal with the the a venue more, and the exit uh, exit exit yeah exit in guys were wonderful to us, and they'd even said, man, you might want to think about maybe moving this to marathon. And I'm like, oh gosh, we've never done more than 300 people. That show we packed. that show we had to turn away over 100 people down. Uh, the, I mean, and people were so great. People like would go out and let other people pay to get in so we could raise money for that's the charity. Great. Yeah, it was. And so now it's always at Marathon, right? Uh, and it's actually no. We've moved since then. We over the years, it's it's honestly we're because there's there now these type of shows are so ubiquitous in Nashville. You don't see the the attendance has fallen somewhat. I mean, just honestly, there's just, there's like something like this almost every week. And you know, in the past, there was it was more of a special event. That's why we've only gone to one a year. And uh, oh, is that what it is? And now? we were yet. Yeah, so then we moved over to the cannery for a while because I have because I took um, loud jams to the high watt, and that's thanks to my friend Yvonne Smith. She hooked me up with Todd, the owner of the venue yeah. and so once we were at high watt the deal was hey how about we bring drummer jam to cannery did it there for a few times for like the phil collins steve smith mm. and then they sat with me and said look you, you're doing two to three hundred people why don't we just move it up in mercy that way you don't have so much overhead more can go to the charity and so we're in mercy lounge and that's where we've done the last couple um joey joey kramer last year and we just did nico mcbrain nico mcbrain yeah, yeah last month i miss nico man oh man everybody played i did i i purposely did not play i mean i get to play on so many of them you know i, I like to pass it off and uh, I asked Andrew Dixon to take my spot because yeah. he coordinates Loud Jam's drummers for me and he crushed and all the players crushed. It was, I mean, 
Uh, it was one of their better shows we've had in terms of just performance, song by song. What's wow. the thing with Loud Jams? Is it the first Monday of every month? Yeah, generally. And what I've done is I've gone to two seasons. We do February, March, and April. And then, because I've tried not, man, I mean, if you see my name, name coming up in your phone, it's like, oh, great, Tom again. I'm trying not to be too much of a bother. <laughs> I got to get locked in there. February, March, uh, Yeah, April. we've got February, March, and April. Got to get in there. Yeah. Oh, dude, of course. That's a given. If you're home, you're in. You know that. And then we d take the summer off and come back and do September, October, November. Really so smart. so six shows, you know, not, not burn people out. And yeah. I've got and we've also, you remember in the day, old days, 30 songs, you know, I, I've learned the hard way. I've, we've cut it down to where we do, uh, right now I try and do 15 songs, That's really great. eight to eight, eight o'clock to about 10, 15, 10, 30. And we're out of that. That's the way to do it. And it's still a free show. You know, we you know, cause that. as much as I, as much as I love Tishy, um, those events are six hours That's and rough. it's like, Oh my God, buddy. Yeah. I mean, it's incredible because everybody wants to play and there's a beautiful bottom drum set and you got a singer that sounds exactly like, yeah. you know, just like plant. Yep. Um, and it's a great thing to be, you're like, Wow, this is long. Well, that's it. If I'm asking you to come out, or if it's you know, let's take Chris Frazier or Ray, you know, your guest, you know, like any of these guys, Lizera, these guys, the fact they'll even take the time, you take the time to do it, means the world to me. And so I really respect your time, and also too the people in the audience because we're we're really each other's audience. I mean, a typical Loud Jams attendance is probably 150, 200 people now, which is great. Yeah, it's basically 60, 70 performers, and probably somebody that came with them, and we get some walk in too. Please tell me you make a little money. I don't. I've done. What? I have done that for free now. For for, so you're doing this just a just community I, I can, outreach. I, I can honestly say I have never made a penny on Loud Jams. I've lost money, but but to be fair though, man, I wouldn't <laughs> so trade it. Well, I wouldn't trade it for the world because Rich, you know you know my ulterior motive. We've done over 700 songs and this comes back around to a creative album. And there's a playlist, right? It's dude, it's that's my thing. When people come to me and go, you ought to do this. I'm like, guys, this is the one thing I hold close to the vest. Yeah, if you come to me with something that's, I'm listening, but I've got 1,500 songs I want to do. So we've done 700. My, and it is selfish. That is the part of it that is the me part every other part i'm man i want people to do what they want to do but i want to hear you know robbie robertson somewhere down the crazy river or i wanted to do yes leave it i don't want to do you know sir duke i love i love stevie but that's been done we did that yeah, yeah you know what i mean i'm deep cuts and that's the and, and that's so i'm probably not going for quite for low-hanging fruit i've had lots of people go man you ought to do this it'd be like this show and it'd be bigger i'm like that's not my intent i just want people, i want cuts. i want people to come have fun yeah and have a great place and that's been the the nice sideline is that new people to town have told me that they've met people they get access to somebody like yourself it's a watering hole that's it you know that guys like us that have maybe been here a long time haven't forgotten what it is to be new to town and that you are always so gracious you'll stand there and talk to anybody that's new and help them out and that's what i love is that it's not a there's no business card thing it's just a real real authentic way that you can make new friends yeah now it's like hey reach over as close as you can get and shout into my ear because I can't hear anything. <laughs> we do call it loud. <laughs> and well, I think it's just the, our hearing. You know, oh my God. Are you lost any high end? Uh, yeah, yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking at the uh, website right now of all the, I was wondering if you had some sort of video component. What is the website? Do. Uh, it's all the Facebook. NashvilleDrummersJam.com. Yeah. NashvilleDrummersJam.com. Yeah. Most of our stuff for both shows is more Facebook and YouTube based. I don't have a Loud Jams website, but we have tons of, like, if you go to YouTube and do uh, Tyson Leslie actually, she does most of the video for me. Yeah. And as you know well, Tyson's here in town because he's doing made, rare yeah. hair. Oh my gosh. And you talk about someone who can put on a show. Yeah. Tyson's rare hair thing is monetized and he raises money for charity. It's amazing. What is that it guy a free does. event? No, they, they do pay. Okay. And because it's so in demand. I mean, everybody wants to be on that thing. It's, I mean, it's packed. He sells out the basement East. Um, that's a big and, venue. And it's just, again, he did it in Kansas city. You know, that's like, we, yeah. as you know, he's here because of you. He always will tell me, he's like, man, the first person I'm, that, you know, got me to come here was rich. And then I met you with loud gyms. Well, we played uh, friends in low places at a club in Kansas city. One really? night, and it was great. <laughs> and, I, awesome. and I was like, who are you? What do you do? He's like, I'm here. I'm like, like you should come to, you know, Dude. somewhere a year where there's a mobile upward advancement. Well, and that's that he's so versatile. And, you know, I remember I met him years ago. He reminded me we played together. He's like, wait, you were playing drums for Sister Hazel. You were subbing for Mark and Pomeroy. His band it was opening for Hazel. Yeah. What a small world. Really, the music world is a small place. Um, there's some, another thing you said you were working on, which is you're creating like a songbook. Uh, yeah. For all the songs that people might play on Lower Broadway in yeah, Nashville. That, and that's to give, again, throwing a little nod to Tyson. He's been really good about doing that, too. The both, I mean, a lot of guys, uh, Jack, I always butcher his last name, Andrew Dung, Andrew Dung, nice guy, young drummer, has done a wonderful Spotify list that I'm, that's what I'm working on. I still, man, I'm going down there because I don't want, I don't want to be that guy sitting in the headlights like I have been going when a girl calls up a new artist like Lauren Lane or something and I don't know it. I want to mm -hmm. at least have a perfunctory understanding. And the reason for this is actually 
actually twofold for the academic setting right. from being at North Alabama and Lee University. I'm looking at all our students and thinking, man, if I can give them the head, the leg up now yeah. that we didn't know really like, Hey, you know, take an hour or two a week, make quick, rich type, you know, card, notes. Your, your notes have a quick chart for all of these tunes. Yeah. There might be a thousand, but at least have 250 to start with. And you can alphabetize them. Yeah. And you can give yourself a fighting chance and then you leapfrog off it. You do one Miranda Lambert tune and you realize, and, and Hey, in the interim, this is the part I always think about you by doing that where I realize and kick myself that I haven't been doing it as much and I'm getting back to it because loud jams of course I do all these crazy you know you know it could be a police tune or rush or big wreck but I'm realizing man when you go and do this it's also juxt uh, juxtaposed perfectly or dovetails perfectly with your your session aspirations because you're studying Chad Cromwell you're mm -hmm. studying you know Greg, uh, Morrow. Greg Morrow and you know all these great great drummers you know yeah. like that's that's the other part yeah. and it's your yourself I mean I literally I've known you a long time and yet I still sit there and learn things about your playing well, I guess, man, I appreciate it. You know, I, I think that if, um, yeah, you are, if you're actively transcribing a song, you yes. are learning the language exactly. of what is expected in, say, a Nashville recording session. That's it. It's not just, it, we're not just using, you know, um, anecdotal uh, conversation. And that's a big, and you know me, what a nerd I am. I'm like, if I'm studying. I can tell with your vocabulary, you've been teaching in college, buddy. <laughs> I'm ready for you to drop pedagogical. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to avoid that's, that's, that's I, I, yeah, I dropped some, I think I dropped Perfunctory, drop, anecdotal I dropped This is great Hold on, I gotta get my dictionary <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm, you know I'm such a University of Florida Gator nerd I grew up in Gainesville so I root for my beloved Gators Gainesville and I, is such a great music town It's a fun little town, man yeah. It's it's cool and It's you, like Denton, Texas that, Isn't it funny to look at like all the people that have come from there when you're Stephen Stills and the pet, you know, of course you know, and I never how in God's name I grew up there never physically saw Petty I mean, I've worked for Stan I've done stuff with Lynch, yeah. but I never saw the Heartbreakers. Never. I mean, I kicked myself on that one. God rest his soul. You know, but yeah, that is, it's unreal. The Eagles and it's crazy. So many great people out of there. It's crazy that I, uh, crazy. I got to know Stan Lynch. Um, and you knew him all these different years through, I, through well, Jack and Amy. Well, I actually. met him through doing like demo sessions at like Warner Chapel writing camps. That's and, like, right. Cause he was writing up here a lot. Tons. Didn't he have a number one from, I think for Tim McGraw, he and uh, Stephanie Smith, I think co-wrote. Oh yeah. And, they and then of course, one. producing all the Don Henley records. He, you know, you know, he tried to get me on that gig. That would have been great. When, when they were doing the, I think it was inside job, the one he was producing. Ooh, yeah. And I was doing a lot for him at that time at his place with Jimmy DeVito over in St. Augustine. And so Stan, Stan's literally, he's like, yeah, talk to Don today about your mic. <laughs> Don Henley's got every drummer on the planet. Who's playing on the record? Vinnie Colliuta, Jeff. Jeff Who ended up doing that tour? It was uh, uh, man. He was like, I didn't know the guy. I, I, I it wasn't. The, I thought it was going to be. Is it Scott Crago or the, Scott Crago plays the Eagles? Eagles, now. but it yeah. wasn't him. It was another guy. And you know, and it was one of those. Hey, I'm in Gainesville, and I think I was back just finishing my bachelor's. This was after House of Dreams had, had yeah. finished our run. We'd gotten dropped from RCA. Jack and Britton were here, and that's when you were doing a lot of stuff with them. And I was just going to school and uh, playing at Disney and teaching teaching a lot well, i mean that's that's your always been your business model to do all three tour record and educate well bruce, bruce jacoby talks to me about that you know from over remo he from always remo, yeah. about you and i both he says man you guys in the thing he says y'all one thing about you guys you're always going to have all the irons in the fire and he says and that way you never are totally dependent on one and, yeah. and i you know it is why you have this house well it's, it's like, it's like if you want to if you want to buy a rainbow roll yeah. it's 13 dollars. <laughs> you know what i mean so like how much are you charging for a drum lesson i want to be able to eat rainbow rolls for the rest of my life <laughs> And it's amazing how many people are so singularly focused. Oh, yeah. And they don't think that way. They yeah. don't diversify. I, sometimes you know, I love, it, I, I like that. But do you guys ever think to yourself, wouldn't it be amazing to just singularly focus? Because, like, you know, when I take acting lessons out it in Los Angeles, oh, yeah. I, I, I work with people that are literally only actors, and then they have to do some sort of silly day job that they hate. So they're usually a barista, or they drive Uber, or they're a waiter. Right. Yeah. And then their only focus is acting. Is, is acting, which is like, wow, what could I accomplish if I could put 24 7 on that? That's the thing. But you that's what we did with drumming. To, you need the pile of cash to. to to balance that. Sure. Sure. And you know, it's an interesting thing, Jim, because that's it. Like you say, you, I think I've always seen that with you and I, Rich, is that we did a lot early and yet I've had, I know both of us have had friends who go, man, you know, if you focus more over here, but I think you also have to be realistic and go, okay, in my vocation, what is the, what is the, the standard mm -hmm. and what, you know, obviously I don't want to just aspire to that, but you know, in your case, yes, could you work at your drumming a lot more? But my gosh, you know, your drumming's on a pretty high level. So I think it, I think sometimes it imbues your, Whole, the, the holistic aspect of who you are yeah. by doing the acting, by doing those elements because I think you come back to music fresh. Yeah, know? for sure. I mean, you, uh, 
you kind of, you know, they have this, there's this saying, uh, you know, those that do, do, and those that can't teach, yeah. which sometimes there is some truth to that. But you have completely broken that idea because when, if I am going to study with somebody, I want to st study with someone who's actually out there walking the walk, talking the talk, and the fact that, and not everybody, even if they have aspirations to teach, sure. they have very poor communication skills, they have no syllabus, they have no material, and that is not the case with you. I mean, you can address somebody that's five years old that's first starting to pick up the instrument, right. or you can address somebody that's 45 years old that took 20 years off from playing that wants to play on Friday and Saturday night in their little small town. You know how to address that person. Well, I, think, I think both of us, we really enjoy those people, too. I, I so admire somebody who's doing it purely for a hobby. I, I was driving up here today on my way, and I'm Still, this is still where my head at. I see Dave Ramsey's building down there on 65. I'm like, man, he'd be someone good to work for. And this is what <laughs> Nick teases me all the time. He's like, don't go get another job. <laughs> Chris is like, spread too thin as like, it Tom, is. He literally gave me the mandate a couple of years ago. <laughs> it was a, a, during a stint where I was between things. And uh, before I started with Tracy, he's like, you need to be hitting things with a microphone in front of him. That's what you do. And don't you dare tell people that you don't. Because he would get on me about kind of, I would. I will go. Oh, gosh, you could get rich. I literally said that to Mike Latanzi. And Latanzi was like... Well, he must not be very good. I mean, I was like, no, you've got Rich Redman near Z. I mean, these guys are brilliant. You know, I mean, sure, if you want me, I'll come play. But yeah, but Tansy, I love him. I haven't you know, seen him in years. You know, exactly. Get I mean, out there. It, what's funny? I live not far from him now. I'm I'm out to the for even further west. So oh, I'm, what a setup! Oh, dude, I love it. Hey, Jim. Is there something you've been dying to ask, Tom? Because Ray Luzier is texting me, and I have to let him know that we're still good. Okay, we are still good, Ray. <laughs> Hi, Ray. What are some of the, I mean, the Nashville Drummer Jam you're doing once a year. Mm -hmm. um, I was trying to think of like who else you could probably, uh, you know, do a tribute to. That's a, you know, a good of, question. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like one of the things that comes to mind is uh, Liberty. DeVito. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Lib, Lib. Oh I mean, God. Ringo Starr. Yeah, uh, you yeah. know, we've talked about the drummers of the uh, drummers of the Who. Mm -hmm. A lot of people talk to us about Kiss, but I respect that one. Uh, we kind of leave that alone because of our buddies Phil Schaus and Jeremy Asbrock. Those guys all work with Gene and, and yes. Ace Freely. And my old roommate Christopher Williams is part of that crew, and he's forgotten more about Kiss than I'll ever know. Right. So Kiss is sort of like I, we won't touch that. If we did, we'd do it with them. Right. We'd say, Hey, fellas, do y'all want to do this as a drummer jam? And how would you like to do it? Because they've hosted our show just like Rich has. Yeah. Um, um, other than that, personal preferences, uh, I really want to do Omar. Omar is kind of one of my great. I really? love, and you know, that's Dream the, of the really? Oh man, you know, that's the hard part. <laughs> really, <laughs> really, Howard. <laughs> Sorry. No, and uh, you know, it's funny, but it, we we did do kind of a tribute to that uh, year before last, and did, you, you played the one that we did all the drummers, basically the drummers of Sting. It was a spring May one, I thought. Yeah, because yeah, didn't you play like Bring on, uh, not Bring on the Night? If you left somebody, set them free. I did. Yeah. 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 And you yeah. crushed it, and that's oh, I mean, thanks. big surprise. He always does. Well, that was uh, you got to have somebody playing tambourine. No, that's yeah. all. Uh, it was kind Omar. of our, it, it was our way to hit those. We it's because there's tunes that Manu did, uh, <clears throat> Kenwood Denard, Omar, Vinny. Um, gosh, who else has played? Maybe even some of the later stuff. I don't know. Has Carlock played on any of the album stuff for him? I know he's played with Sting and of course um, the brilliant uh, Josh Freeze. Josh Freeze. That's what I was going to say. Those. I don't know if those guys have done any album work for him. Maybe what Josh. about what about doing one that's you know obviously it's a Nashville drummers jam yeah but you do it in tribute to one of the Nashville drummers oh we've you know? talked about Larry Almost, you know like Larry London or somebody but even like as a parody you know kind of like a funny one off type of thing you know I don't think whoever the recipient would be would like to know it's a parody. <laughs> But you know what I mean? You know, well, I, I can give you one on this. I asked Eddie Bears on the Opry uh, a couple months back. I said, Eddie, I know this is going to sound kind of weird. You want to play some Nico McBrain? And he was so sweet. He's like, man, that'd be fun. And I said, I'm like asking the most recorded drummer of our time. He wants to play Iron Maiden. Iron Maiden. Bum, 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 I just wanted to see Eddie up there. Because he doing triplets. Yeah, but he'd have to have the left hand. He'd have the left hand straight up right side. <laughs> He is such a doll, man. That guy, what a gem. I mean, he, that dude's done more in a week than I've done in my recording career, and it's just, he's always so kind, man. I am just, really is. I'm having a moment right here. I'm just so excited that that um, all of my favorite drummers and people in the world are sitting in this chair. They're coming, they're coming to this room. They're sitting Dude. in this chair. I'm thinking, We're having conversations. I'm thinking more about how Kevin Murphy is and how he always kind of cajoles you. He always does that. Yeah, <laughs> he's always, you know, yeah. He's always poking the sleeping bear. And what if he did a Kevin Murphy tribute and everybody plays and acts like Kevin Murphy. 
<laughs> We'd have to have his charts. Have you ever seen Kevin's charts? He, just, he doesn't transcribe stuff. He has like phrases. He'll like, you know, <laughs> Redmond rocks. And that would to him mean a particular style pattern that yeah. Rich would play on a bridge. Right. And that's and that for him is the same as me, like looking at my little note by note transcription. Yeah, one E and a two and a three and or five, six, seven, one, two, three. He just counted exactly what I played. One E and two and a three and four. He would just tell the weird pedagogical. Busting out the pedagogy. Perfunctory. So um here's a here's a here's a quiz for you. Uh page thirty eight of syncopation, the magic page. Oh lord. You know what? Are you talking the back seven? I don't know page numbers. I know the I in the back to do but the ones that we play is like the comedy. My favorite read. My favorite page is the is depending on what version of the book is. You had better thirty seven or page pedagogical. Is this is this nerdy Ted Reed syncopation? We're Ted reading out here. Totally is, but I wanted to see if you had it. Oh, Rich, you were like so much better. After doing that case study on you, dude, it made me realize. I'm like, wow, I have gaping holes in my... Uh, what did you have to do for the case study? I, I remember my time. You, I didn't, uh, it was just, one quick interview, but yeah. what did you have to do? Uh, well, I wrote my thesis. That was I did a master's thesis. It was about 80 pages with my review of Lit and everything, and uh, it was on vernacular musicianship, which actually is it's basically what School of Rock does. The idea of like that they embrace the non... like It's like, hey, man, first and foremost, before you go to any ivory tower institution, why do we play? We just want to make music. We want to express ourselves and right. be creative, right? And we do that in a non you know non formalized setting and that's basically and you are such a great example of somebody who comes from that tradition and always has tapped into that but has the educational pedagogy you know? <laughs> so if somebody wanted to read the thesis does yeah, it yeah. exist in the yeah, world yeah. somewhere I've actually I've, I've, uh, I think a long time ago you wouldn't remember I, you I, gave it to I, me I emailed it to you yeah. and I have it and if you've met I'll tell you what it is awesome if you're having trouble sleeping or anything of sort, I guarantee you because there's a lot of footnotes oh, okay. and you, you had to change my name to like Roger what, or what's something, your name right? yeah, yeah. I, can't, I was thinking about that the other night I was like I got to go look at what we called Rich because I when I did it, my advisor it was head of my department. He says you can't use his real name. Huh. It's I I I A B whatever some kind Roger of Roger Redmond. Yes, yeah, so Roger Redmond. <laughs> yeah, but man, it is really funny. I can remember I was transcribing after we did the interview. I had shows in, with Tracy out and out west, and I'm sitting in a bathtub in my hotel room out in New Mexico. That I know you've played this place. It's up on a lake. It's beautiful up in the mountains. Yeah. And, you know, and I'm I'm there transcribing with my headphones on. You know, and man, realizing Rich and I boy. You get the two of us talking, and dude, I, I forget thirteen thousand words or something that I dude, started. I mean, we're we're at seventy five minutes. It feels like it's been ten seconds. Yeah. <laughs> we talked, we talked a lot of stuff. So, Jim, yeah, what did you learn today? You know, um, I, I learned to appreciate the Van Halen brothers a lot more. I, a lot of people uh, make fun of me because I I talk about Van Halen, but they're a big part of my musical upbringing mm -hmm. uh, and my drumming and. Um, I can. I have a better appreciation from what you've told me about the experience you had with. He's uh, a one of a kind drummer too. Yeah. I mean, oh, he really is. Uh, they're so they're musical. You know, with their dad being a clarinetist. I have a question for you guys. You know, we always talk about underrated drummers. Alex being one of them. You know, uh, what are what are the two drummers that really come to mind? And I'm kind of popping this on you right now. That's okay. That 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 makes you that you know they need better more do. You know what I mean? Anybody you feel come like to mind? Rich? Uh, people always say Levon Helm. Oh gosh, yeah. Uh, two that to me are a little more obscure and have done is Andy Newmark uh, was played on tons. Roxy of big, music. Yeah, yep. And then Sly. Uh, yeah, I mean Andy's amazing. And then the one my personal, he's just because he's my personal favorite, and I, most of us would know him. But uh, it's a guy named Phil Gould, the drummer from Level, Level Forty Two. He's that guy. Yeah. We're friends on we're friends on Twitter. Yeah, he's <laughs> yeah. Uh, brilliant that guy I, I think he's one of my favorite of what all was time. the 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 really popular level 42 record when they were really super popular in like 88 89. running in the family running yeah and they the did family. that they had that tune lessons in love yeah uh, fa fashion fever a lot right. of right-handed <sighs> oh, that's well you know everyone that knows me that's the tom beat that's all i can't play straight eights i literally was doing the eastern corbin gig seven for david black and they're like tom man it sounds great but could you not play that I was like, oh, sorry. Just, they were like, we just like the eighth note. I was like, oh, my bad. <laughs> so, sorry about that. That's the full gold in me coming out. Take out the Annas, okay? Yeah, we don't need any uhs. Just give me a good solid one and two and. <laughs> you know what I learned, Jim? I learned the fact that um, you can be a touring musician, recording musician, and an educator. And Tom Hurst, TomHurst.com sums it all up. Right on. It's pretty incredible, yeah? How do people find you? Find you and follow you. 
Yeah, pretty much. I think those are the, the Tom um, Hurst through my website, TomHurst.com. You're uh, on the gram? Yeah, I'm on the gram. But, but it's, uh, it's, it's a funny name. Yeah, it's a Jam and Jethro TH Drums. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. Boy, you can see I'm really good at the, at this whole marketing thing. <laughs> yeah. J A M N M M I N. Yes, yes. Jethro. Jethro TH Drums. <laughs> And uh, it might be easier sometimes to follow too. My my loud jams is that's you can just do loud jams. That's our uh, other and Instagram. Jethro. Yep. What's Jethro? Is that your nickname? That's that comes from all the Disney musicians because I was like eighteen or nineteen working with guys in their thirties that all again like I said I mean they had serious resumes you know North Texas guys and they played and toured everywhere and then there's me with like a year of community college lucky <laughs> lucky to find middle C on the you know on this grand staff so that was that's Jethro it was kind of a it wasn't a term of endearment initially it was like Jethro get it together because you know these guys were reading really pretty difficult stuff they weren't going to commit your name to memory yeah. we had six yeah, to yeah. nine months oh yeah they were like I'm making the same money as that kid <laughs> yeah <laughs> so. but I mean all these years later now you have a master's degree yeah. you have of so many educational offerings. You're a college professor. You toured the world with Wang Chung, Tiffany, Backstreet Boys, the who's who of the country world. You can hear yourself on the radio. You did it, man. Oh, bro. Right What's back next? at you. What's next? I think it's just, you know, uh, really to be more, uh, it's going to sound funny, but to be kind of kind of perpetual student. You said it a minute ago, like my curricular components, I don't have that much put together and put out there. You've done such a great job of that. You know, Jim Riley's done that so well. Yeah. I've got, I really want to tie the Loud Jams concept and that music. And I've been doing it. Like, it's basically my whole thing is that I want the, my pedagog, pedagogical efforts, if you will, to be steeped in the ideas of like, okay, what are these great classic songs? Now, these are just, it might just for be- For popular music. For popular music. Yeah. Like, over the last 40 to 50 years, much the same way that the classical repertory that you're looking at, Porgy and Bass, or, you know, Standard Lit that you're supposed to, I think, you know, it's like, hey, I want a young kid to know there's this Steely Dan tune Asia, man, you've got to know this. I think starting in the 60s would be good. So, yeah. 60s, you have like, so the start of the British invasion, right? Yeah. Then you have 70s rock and singer song Writers. Then you have new wave, yep. heavy metal. You have the '90s alternate yeah, Seattle alternative, thing, yep. and then we get start getting into southern band thing in the late '90s, like Matchbox Twenty and Hazel and the that. pop thing. And if you look at the Loud Jams repertory, I'm also interested in today. I mean, I look at it, man. The Killers are then they're not. I mean, gosh, they're 10, 15 years now. But like brand new bands, I uh, I use bands like Portugal the Man. They're still probably five years. But I'll find these groups, not just myself, but a lot of a lot of our participants bring some amazing groups. Yeah. That are just, I feel like, are just as significant. You know, you take a Ting Ting's tune or you the drama, the drama, yeah, you know? the drama. I mean, that's I like man, that song. I yeah. think that's that's another thing I've always loved about you is you're the same way. Neither of us, I don't ever want to be, and it, it's easy to slide down that hole, like, uh, you know, to get kind of fatigue on new material. But that's, I guess, to say what's next is really just trying to stay open to new ideas, not get jaded. I, I fall prey to that. I had a friend kind of teasing me about it out at NAM last year. And yeah. I was. I was kind of the Instagram sensation thing. I was kind of getting grouchy. And I was like, wait a minute, Tom. Man, these, these, are, these kids are inspiring and it's exciting and good for them. Yeah. You know, and I just wanted to kind of check myself. So that's really it. I just want to stay fresh and just try and kind of embrace the next generation. You know what would be a good thing to do? Uh, transcribe some of the hi-hat patterns on like a Drake song. Oh, dude. You know, because it's all like... Oh, man, this whole... Yeah, well, these new you Jacob, know? like that. What is Jacob, that? Sixty four songs. I mean, gee, that's, I guess. That's, that's twice as fast as thirty seconds. You yeah. know what I have trouble with is this whole kind of pseudo swung, and it comes. Somebody explained to me they're getting it quantizing wise from quintuplets. That that mm -hmm. it's sort of like the Cuban triplet thing. But you, Jacob Collier does it, and a lot of the really new hip hop, like anyone in that snarky puppy universe. Mm -hmm. Which, by the way, talk about inspiring. Great that, band. Yeah, it's like the weather report for a new generation with the vocals. You're right, it is. But anyways, that's that's the thing. Is like I catch myself. I'm like, oh, there's nothing new other nonsense. You yeah. know, just just turn on Spotify, man. I mean, Video I, game music. I yeah. keep I keep revisiting. You know, I don't know if everybody else out there will agree, but I think some of the greatest music in the world happened between 1969 and 1981. Oh, you get no argument from me. It's you know, brilliant. So you know, you're getting you're getting the end of the British invasion. You're getting all the classic rock. So you're getting all of the bands. So you have the Stones, the Beatles, yeah. the Who, the, the Led Doors. Zeppelin. <laughs> and then you're getting into the Knack, yep. Blondie. All that, oh, and man. in that little period. So I revisit that. I'm a big sucker for Americana. So, you know, Steve Earle, Mellon Camp, Lucinda. John Hyatt. All yeah. that. Oh, man, Carwell's on a gravel road. Lucinda Williams, that's one of the amazing albums. Oh, high five, buddy. I'm so, sorry, like, man. I there's probably not a week that goes by that I won't crank up car wheels on a gravel road. Oh, dude, the, one of the coolest things I ever got to do here was a gig I didn't get. I got to audition for Rodney Crowell. 
Yeah. Uh, Keo got the gigs. Keo got the gigs. how we met. Oh, oh, you guys, there was an open audition for that? Remember when I was playing with Jed Hughes, because you came out to our basement shows, and Keo and I, it was basically we got invited. Jed recommended me, because, mm. you know, we weren't doing that much playing, and he and Kevin, and so Rodney was nice enough to have me in, and, and uh, I think Neoshi was going on to play with Trisha Yearwood. There's a we? bunch of um, names missing off of your the people that you've worked with oh yeah you left off a lot of names oh dude it's you know it's funny because I, I I feel like I already need to bring a shovel along for all the names I drop everywhere so <laughs> but I, but it is kind of funny you know how it goes so you yeah. get going and especially I can remember good lord all the showcases I'd see you do I mean Jim that's one of the things that really kicked me in the butt when I came up here with our band with House of Dreams I knew Rich but to then see him playing like every week and I assume most of a lot of that was with Kurt and Tully I just and didn't just I didn't know him at the time tons of unsigned artists oh, trying man. to make their dreams come true dude you guys would take people and elevate them i mean they'd be doing a pretty good job but you'd go see them play third and lindsley the old third and lindsley or wherever and heck i just remember sir i remember literally walking out of sir one day kind of scared watching rich he'd like <laughs> i went i thought i was kind of prepped for my gig with amy and i went away and went i gotta go shed because like he the way and i knew he just was doing this one thing for this girl and he was probably running to do something else 20 minutes later <laughs> and, and it just was really it's it's why i say i mean i'm you know i'm a staunch fan oh man we're in the mutual admiration society here man so i'm so proud of you i think guys that are um I'm turning 50 in six months. Right on. And are you there yet? I'm, yeah, I'm 51. I just turned 51. Nice. But did you go big with fire trucks and strippers and midgets no. and that stuff? Or what? No, man. On my 50th, I was actually out again at that same place in New Mexico. I was at the exact same place where I transcribed your uh, Did you at study. least order yourself a fillet, fillet I, mignon? I did. I, did a, I, I, didn't, <laughs> I didn't get a fillet mignon, but I got myself some, like, some, some pretty- Some I got some sushi. Nice. Went down Hopefully it was me. the rainbow roll. Oh, yeah, dude. I'm all about rainbow and spider roll. Sign me up. Yeah, hey, all day. Everybody's moving to Nashville. So if you guys are thinking about moving to Nashville, you're going to run into Tom Hurst. Be sure to check out the Nashville Drummers Jam. Be sure to check out Loud Jams, which is on the first Monday Jim. of February, March, and April. Yep. And September, October, November. Yeah, we've got March, will be February 3rd, March 2nd, and April 6th. And I can't remember the fall dates, but yeah. Check out Tom on the road with Tracy Lawrence. And you're going to see him all over the place because he fills in for all sorts of people. He's the drummer that comes in and saves the day when you're sick or you got to get married or you got to go to a funeral he's going to show up and do the gig for you i'll have my head turned over staring at my transcribed charts but and then yes. really quick and then really quick your uh pearl remo yeah pearl remo innovative percussion i've been with pearl now 22 years Congrats. and remo 22 years innovative uh, about three years now and zildjian for uh gosh going on about seven so well, i know they're they all amazing you. i know they love having you as a brand ambassador so jim thanks for what you do man all the time and talent yeah, you bring buddy. to this and i hope everybody that's out there listening is enjoying the show if you have any suggestions or feedback or questions we have an email address the rich redmond show at gmail.com as always thank you to school of rock for sponsoring the show franklin at school of rock.com nashville at school of rock.com as always we appreciate a five star rating rate review subscribe share keep coming back for the good stuff and we'll see you next time this has been the rich redmond show subscribe rate and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts.